recording in progress. Hey, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining me for another chance to talk about Scripture, to get out our Bibles, to look at prophecy, to look at what's going on, to learn, to grow. Um, so get out your Bibles. We're going to be doing a Bible study. Um, I'm not going to ask right now for a little patience. Um, I've got a new computer, a new laptop. I am not a tech guy by any means. So I'm looking at some ways to do things to try to get the sound better and everything. And when I use my son's laptop and everything looked nicer, I said, oh, I got to get one. So I did. Um, who knows? Maybe I'll even be able to show you scriptures on the screen one day. Yeah, again, I'm not a tech guy. and I'm busy, got a lot going on. So I can only put, only put so much time into this. But this really is a priority. So at this point, we want to talk about Teshuvah. This video is late. Teshuva already started a while ago. What's Teshuva, you might say? Well, let me start by saying this. I'm recording this on Sunday the 20th on our pagan calendar. And on our pagan calendar, August 17th, at evening twilight, a twinkling of an eye, same thing when two stars of medium strength are visible and you turn to the next day. On August 17th is when Teshuva started. This is big. This is huge. I'm going to start by reading something from Shabad, S-C-H-A-B-A-D.org about Teshuva. It is, this is a Jewish site. So let me read this a little bit. Um, and it's actually pretty cool. The word Teshuva is usually translated as repentance. In fact, there is a well-known prayer recited on the high holy days that Teshuva, um, Tafala, and Zidak, and I'm probably mispronouncing those, translated as repentance, prayer, and charity, can avert an evil decree. Interesting, an evil decree, because you know what? The High Holy Days, it's all about decrees, and you'll see why in a minute as we talk. This translation is not entirely accurate. The Shuva is better, re, um, the Shuva is better translated as return, and signifies a return to the original state. Keep that in mind, return to the original state. Classically, teshuva is comprised of three ingredients, a regret of a misdeed, a decision of change, and a verbal expression of one sense. Technically, however, one sins, one is mandated to do I'm sorry, technically, whenever one sins, one is mandated to do teshuva. So this is basically repentance, period. So we're going to be talking about that as well. However, the 10 days of teshuva between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are specifically designated for teshuva. When the gates of prayer and repentance are more open than at any other time during the, the cyclical Jewish year. Wow. I'm going to read that last part again. See, the 10 days, it's Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. That represents tribulation. You know, Revelation 2.10, um, you'll be taken off. You'll have tribulation for 10 days. I want to read that again. However, the 10 days of Teshuvah between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are specifically designated for Teshuvah when the gates of prayer and repentance are more open than any other time during the cyclical Jewish year. Let's keep reading here. Uh, Kabbalistically, Bala, Jewish mysticism. I mean, I'm not real keen on that personally. I think it's straight from the pit of hell, but there is stuff that can be learned. The Shuva takes on a more cosmic um dynamic and it goes into these really deep like you know words and letters and different things to come up with a meaning what it's basically going to say and i'm going to try to remember to attach this uh link to the video in the comments if i say i'm going to attach something and i don't call me out on me on it and i'll add it in it's interesting because what it when you read through this and i don't understand it all but it gives you the gist of returning everything to the original state before man sinned. Wow. Oh, 
my coffee cup's empty. Be right back. Now I got to figure out how to pause this. There. Recording in progress. All right, I got some more coffee. I'm good. Um, it's just real interesting to see that because Teshuva really manifests itself in a way. These 40 days, it's really cool as we see them, and it takes us into the millennial kingdom when Messiah will come back. He will take back the land of Israel. You know, the land goes back to the original owner. And talking about a year of Jubilee, what does Messiah say? The land is mine. It's kind of interesting. It's really cool. So let's get into this. I'm I'm gonna so as we go through this, I'm gonna talk about Teshuva and repentance a little bit, how it, but I'm first gonna start about playing out how it plays out on the calendar year and how it's gonna play out, could play out in 2023. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about um Messiah and his time in the wilderness because that happened during Teshuva. Um, and I'd be willing to bet there's a you know a lot of events, 40 days, you know, Daniel's prayer, um, Daniel's fast, a lot of things when you see 40 days probably were Teshuva during that time of the year, because it's a specific time of the year. Um then we're gonna get to how do I word this? What does repentance really look like? What does God want? And as much as people aren't going to like it, somebody's going to, I know this is going to draw ire because this is a very volatile topic. How do Christians follow the law? Because that's what it comes down to. You know, you look at this, you're supposed to repent. We're told to do good. How do we know what's good? Did God give us a test and he's going to judge us on doing good versus bad, but not tell us what it is? No, he told us. It's, I mean, he's not like some old teacher that's going to give you this big, important pass or fail test, not tell you what's on it. No, he did. It's called Torah. And we're going to look at that. But that's going to be toward the end. So if, if that like really bothers you, you don't want to hear about that. Um, I wish you would. You know, that's kind of the underlying theme of a lot of my videos, because I think a lot of people's lives depend on that. But if not, you might you may stick around for the beginning and, and get something out of this. All right. So let's get going into this. Teshuva. First, I'm just going to um, talk about it for a little bit. These 40 days. It starts on a low one and ends on Tishri 10. What is Tishri 10? Yom Kippur. It's 40 days. These are the 40 days that Messiah would have been in the wilderness where he was tested. Um, this, and it, the last 10 days, as mentioned here, the high holy days are the days of all. Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. There are two times on the Jewish calendar where they have days of judgment. Yom Hedin, there's two of them. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It is believed that during Teshuva, this is a time of prayer and repentance and trying to get yourself right with God, that on Rosh Hashanah is a day of judgment, but not everybody's judged because not everybody's truly good or truly bad. Um, and then on Yon, then you, if you're not judged on that day, you have 10 more days to get right with God. And during these 10 days, I'm sorry, at the end of these 10 days is the final judgment and everybody else is judged. And it's as to whether or not you're going to live or die in the upcoming year. Um, I believe on Rosh Hashanah, the uh, customary greeting is may your name be inscribed in the book of life. Now it's not, I think I'm off by a little bit, but it's very close to that. That's interesting. May your name be inscribed in the book of life. And I, I feel sorry for Jewish people because this is something they do every year. But then again, if as a Christian, we have to understand that repentance is a way of life. This is not a one and done thing. It's not like you raise your hand and you've got eternal life for it. I know, I know, I know. But read scriptures on repentance. Why is it such a big topic? All right. So... And there's all kinds of stuff with Rosh Hashanah. The gates are open and different things. And, and 
Where do I want to go? Sorry about that. All right. So Messiah spent 40 days in the wilderness. He came out on Yom Kippur. Okay. This is Teshuva. It's classic. He's being tested. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get over here. Oh, yes, I did. So let's go to Matthew 4.4. 4. What does Messiah say when he's being tempted? Okay, so we're going to go to Matthew 4.4. 4. And what does he say in um, the temp? Uh, start in verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, "It this always, give me a second. You might need time to get there. Anyhow, I got to get to the, I like the new King James version of the Bible. To be honest, there is no perfect version of the Bible. You got to get into the words and all, um, the meanings of words a lot of times. And sometimes you got to get into the Old Testament to understand where things started from, to understand what's really being said. To me, the new King James version is fairly close. And it's easy to understand. That's why I use it. So, um, four three. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, "If you are the Son of Man, command these stones to become bread." And Messiah said, "But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God." That's a good answer, isn't it? Yeah, Messiah got that good answer. He just come up with that? No. That's actually part of Torah. See, the law, Torah, what does it mean? Instruction. Ooh, so law is actually a bad um, word for it. It means instruction. These are instructions Messiah gave us to live our lives. Yes, he gave it to the Jews. But as I've done in my other video, we are videos, we're the stranger. And when the when Israel accepted Messiah and accepted the law, I should say that when they accepted the law and they said they're going to follow it when it was given to them, the stranger was with them. Scripture tells us there will be one law for the native born and for the stranger who resides with you. And you know what? Our inheritance is the land. The only way that the, the, the non-Jews are getting any inheritance is if they are the stranger. I'm going to hit on that real quick, but let's go to Deuteronomy um, 8, verse 3. Um, we'll start in verse 1, okay? Every commandment which I command you today... You must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord has swore to your fathers. Keep in mind that going into the millennial kingdom for us, you know, after tribulation, we have a picture of it before, and that's when Israel was going into the promised land. Um, and you, verse 2, Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Verse 3. So humble your, I'm sorry, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you no, that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Actually, throughout Messiah's ministry, he's quoting Torah, he's quoting Isaiah, he's quoting David. Messiah is the prophet like Moses that would be raised up. When he tells us in the book of John, I believe, I forget the passage, that he only speaks the words that the Father gives him, he's telling us that he is the prophet like Moses that would be, rain, that would be raised up. Um, let's go, I got to find this real quick. Go to a, we're going to go to Ezekiel. I want to say it's 45 or 46. I just want to look at a promise that we have. Um. Three, could be 44. 
Ezekiel 40 through 48 is all about the millennial kingdoms. Nope, it's not 44. So let's go to... Okay, I've got it. Um, Ezekiel 47. This is our inheritance. You shall divide the land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. It shall be that you will divide it as a lot, as an inheritance for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you. You and you and who bear children among you. I'm sorry. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel. Children of Israel was a mixed multitude coming out of Egypt. And based on his um on um Ezekiel 43 that Messiah is going to be living in the midst of the children of Israel forever. If you're not a part of the children of Israel, you're not with him. I'm sorry, that they, sh um, they shall be as native born among the children of Israel and you shall have an inherit and they shall have an inheritance with you among the tribes. And it shall be that in whatever tribe the stranger dwells there, you shall give him his inheritance says the Lord God. Hmm. That's our inheritance. I always say, where do you want to live? Near Messiah in Jerusalem? Um, fishing is going to be great, but down by the Dead Sea, it's going to have all the same fish as the Mediterranean, but in abundance. You know, I'm torn. I love the sea. Maybe a nice something on the Mediterranean, but then it, and you know, maybe a mountain cottage. But then again, I want to be near the Lord. I want to be in Jerusalem. But we'll see how that plays out. Um. So Messiah is telling us every word of scripture, and he's quoting Torah. Now, when Messiah comes out, go back to Matthew 4, okay? And so Messiah has this time with Satan, with the spirit of the Antichrist, um, and he's being tempted. He comes out on to at Tisu when it's interesting. He, we talked about how he went into the temple and quoted part of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. But when he comes out from the wilderness, what is the first words out of his mouth? What is the first word out of his mouth after this 40 time, this 40 day period of repentance? Actually, it's not really repentance for him. But the first word out of his mouth is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does it mean that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? It means it's here, it's almost here, it's about to start. And it would have if they would have accepted Messiah as their, if they would have accepted Messiah, it would have been, the kingdom of heaven would have been there. John the Baptist would have been Elijah, but they didn't. Messiah knew this. But the first words out of his heart, he was mouth to repent. And somehow, all of a sudden, like, you're blasphemy. Repent. That means it's work. Oh, my goodness. That stirs up some stuff. Um, let's look at a couple other things. Go to 2 Peter. And, and start looking at verses about repentance. And you'll see that um, the bi biblical writers didn't get really upset about the thought of repentance. Before we go here, I forgot to do one other part. Um, we're talking about repentance individually. We're talking about the meaning of teshuva, repentance, individually, these 40 days. Corporately, in the bigger picture, at the end of the 40 days, Messiah comes down. Okay, because Rosh Hashanah is rapture. Yom Kippur is the, day of is the Day of Atonement. That's that final judgment day. That is the day that Armageddon happens, and Messiah is going to be walking into the temple and sitting in his throne, and the millennial kingdom is going to get set up. And um, 
the tabernacles is all about the millennial kingdom. Okay. This is when things get set back. As the, the Kabbalists were talking about Teshuva, the 40 days of repentance, that things return to the way they were. Because the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is a love story. You know, when man sins and man falls, and the rest of the Bible is trying to get us to the end of Revelation, where there's a new heaven and a new earth. Everything else is in, in between as a love story about how God is trying to bring us back into that relationship, that living arrangement with him. I hope that makes sense. It's because it's really cool when you realize that. It's the return. And whenever you see return, return is also repentance. It's not doing what you were doing. It's not just a thought of a mind thing. It's going back to the way things should have been, going, not doing it anymore, turning away from the sin. All right, let's go to Second Peter. And, we're, and again, by the end of the video, we're going to be looking more and more at what that looks like biblically. But anyhow, Second Peter 3, 9. And it's, this is all talking about the end times, okay? The next phrase out of Peter's mouth after this verse is about the day of the Lord, which doesn't make sense because he, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. And Messiah said, behold, I come as a thief. Um, I'm not going to go to, and I've got videos about the thief in the night. If you want to Google Dave Paul thief in the night, you can see them. But that's at the beginning of that last thousand years. But then he talks about that heaven and earth passing away, but that's because the day is a thousand years. Okay, so he's got different events in that verse 10 there. But look at nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. What is the Lord's promise to us? Hmm? What is this promise? It's eternal life, right? We're there. As some now slackness but long-suffering towards us. That means patient. He's patient with us. And I'm glad because I should have burned and fried a long time ago. Not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So it's perish or come to repentance. You would think salvation would be there. But this verse right here lets you know that without repentance, there is no salvation. Let's go ahead and look at one more verse in Revelation 16. Revelation 16, we are near the end of all the judgments and all these terrible things. And the purpose of judgment is to bring people to repentance. And we're going to look at Revelation 16, verse 11. And this is uh, the, fifth bowl, the fifth bowl judgment. Okay, what does it say? They um, they blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores. And they did not, I'm sorry, and they did not repent of their deeds. So even the judgments throughout tribulation is trying to bring about repentance for the deeds. Okay, we get judged by our deeds, whether it be at the um, Bema Seat Judgment and we'll be looking at a little later, or at the great white throne judgment. You are judged by your deeds, but that's not how you're saved. Um, we are saved by grace through faith. It's the way it's always been. How was Abraham accredited as righteousness? Because of his faith. But that faith was a deed that he was willing to offer his son, Isaac, up as a sacrifice. Was Abraham a Jew? No. It's Jacob whose name got turned to Israel. Jacob is the first Jew. Abraham was a Gentile. And through him, all the nations are blessed. He is that olive tree that we get grafted into. Um, let's look at, and the law always has been there. 
it has from the beginning. Um, just one question to try to explain it. How did, during the flood, when the flood happened before or after the law was given, before, how did Noah know what the clean and unclean animals were? Seriously, how did he know? Because he had so many of the unclean animals and so many of the clean animals. How did he know which was which? God doesn't give him a description. He knew. Why was Cain and Abel doing sacrifices before the command to give sacrifices was given? See, it was there from the beginning. So let's go to, we want to look at something that's really cool. And the question, a lot of people, how do I follow the law? A lot of people are like, eh, I'm not going to follow that law. Um, how do I want to start? Let's go to 1 John 3, 4. I think we can all agree that living in sin is bad. Sin bad, right? Not sin bad like, you know, the never mind. But that sin is bad. I think we can all agree on that, right? So let's get a definition of sin as John gave it to us. And you have to understand, John wrote much later than all of the other writers in the Bible. And John, um, did I get in the right place? No, I didn't. Give me a second. Actually, let's. I, I clicked here by accident, and I think we're supposed to go here, so we're going to go there. John saw so much... Um, he died, John died 90 AD. We're talking 60 years after Messiah was crucified. We're talking 30 years after all the other biblical writers had passed away or something in that ballpark. And he was seeing all this um, sin, all this worldly stuff, all these things that are not about God seeping into the churches. And you see that in the letters to the churches. In Revelations 2 and 3, which represent the church age, most of them, they don't do really well. Actually, six out of seven would fail any test. It appears that way. Not that they have no hope in those letters to the churches. Therefore, the church is plural, even though they're written to one. The church in this says, he who has an ear, let them hear. That's for everybody. So everybody's supposed to learn lessons from those churches. They represent the church age. But let's go, I clicked on here by mistake. I love this passage. We're going to cover it. 1 John 2, starting in verse 3. It's a test of how you know Messiah. Now, this, by this we know, if we know him, if we keep his commandments. Ooh. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we know him. He goes on, wants to be really clear about this. He who says he abides in him, who walks in him, with him, ought to also walk just as he did. Did Messiah keep the law, keep all the commandments? Yes. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have heard from the beginning. Did I skip something? I did. I am so sorry. Let's go back to verse 4. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly, the love of God is perfected in him. And this, we know that we are in him. He who walks, he who says he abides in him ought to walk himself just as he walked. And then he says that he hasn't doesn't give us a new commandment, but an old commandment from the beginning. Um, so, interesting. Let's go to uh, 1 John uh, 3. This is error, so I'm sorry. 1 John 3, and we're going to go to verse 4. Whoever commits sin 
commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Ooh, that's not good. So we know sin's bad, so lawlessness must be bad. If you looked up the definition of lawlessness, and actually I think I can do that here real quickly. So I'm actually just going to read it to you. And in Greek, it's got it. Here we go. I'm reading straight from Strong's at this point. It's the condition of without law because of because ignorant of it, because of violating it of it. Contempt and violation of law, iniquity, wickedness. That's what sin is. Okay. If you continue to live in sin, from the time you met Messiah on, did you really need him? Hmm? Seriously. We're going to look at a couple of verses with regard to this. Let's start with Matthew 7, verse 23. Here we go. Saddest words anybody could hear. And I'm not going to take the time to go through this chapter like all the way, but there's a way, a wide and a narrow way. There's fruit being um, talked about. And then the people come to him and say, we'll go back to verse 21, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. Well, if you love him, You'll obey his commands. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? They're saying, hey, look at my fruit. And what does Messiah say? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Messiah is saying, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let's go now to Matthew 13, 41. I know I've done and walked through these before, but there's probably people that are watching this that haven't seen it. There's another place that Messiah tells us to depart from him. If Messiah tells you to depart from him, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a terrible thing. Okay, this is about the wheat and the tares. And the wheat and the tares is all about the church, the church growing up. There's going to be three levels of measure sown into the, the meal until all of the meal is leavened. Well, the meal came from the seed, which was the good seed, which became the wheat, and then you made the meal. It Basically, the story tells you that by the time the kingdom of heaven comes, that all the churches, all the synagogues are going to be full of leaven, which represents pagan idolatry, which represents... Thing. All right. Um, I did a video on that. If you've got a question, let me know. I'll throw it up here for you. Um, yeah, by the time Messiah returns and you know tribulation happens, all the churches are going to be messed up. So he's talking about the wheat and the tares. The tares produce fruit, but the tares fruit is blank again poisonous and enemies would actually come and sow tares into your wheat field to try to mess you up so they're coming and saying hey didn't you sow good seed and should we um how do we just and should we pull them out and he says no don't pull them out now because you might pull out some of the good ones so then he said the son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that are thin and those who practice lawlessness. See, this is the two in the field. One's taken, one's not. You don't want to be taken at that point. That's not the rapture. Seriously. 
that's not um go on for that for a little while but i'm not matthew 24 does not talk about the rapture other than the fact that the day of the lord the last thousand years starts with the rapture and the hour which is the hour of our testing tribulation not our testing but the hour of testing that's going to come upon the whole world okay starts at starts at the rapture that's it that's about the only thing matthew 24 has to do with the rapture all right, so we've got these two things. But now there seems to be a contradiction with what he's saying here about lawlessness and being gathered out of the kingdom with, with what Messiah says in Matthew 5. So let's go to Matthew 5. If you're getting to a point where you're saying, eh, this is too long, I really don't want to hear this. Bottom line, dude, we're in Teshuva. The rapture could be at Rosh Hashanah this year. You need to be praying. You need to be repenting. You need to be asking God to search your heart and to show you ways that are unlike that about you that are unlike him. And you make that evident. And so you can stop doing it and turn the other way. And again, Matthew 5. Um, where do we want to go? This is where people believe it says Christ fulfills the law. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. That means that's what you wish it in, means to misinterpret, to try to make it say something it doesn't. Um, but I did come to, I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill, that means to fill with understanding. That's how if you read down in Matthew 5, verse after verse, it says, you have heard it said this, but I tell you this. He's telling you that you are taught wrong, and I'm trying to teach you correctly. Um. But look at this. He says, whoever therefore, assuredly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one or one tittle will by any means pass away from, from the law till it is all fulfilled. Okay, so, and a lot of people say, no, it's not passed away. It's just fulfilled and done away with. Read, read verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So if you got a pastor leading a big church and they're having, you know, um, ham and cheese sandwiches for lunch, worshiping on a Saturday, telling you the, sa the Sabbath, you don't have to do it anymore. That pastor and the people in his congregation that follow him have the best they can look forward to is being least in the kingdom of God. Let's keep reading in this one. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called greatest in the kingdom, or great in the kingdom of heaven. Yes, there are positions, there are rewards that will be given. We're gonna we will have positions, whether you know, kings and priests, and it depends on how you are judged. And we will be judged based on our works. All right. So how do you get from this, where you're at least in the kingdom of heaven, but at least you're there, to being gathered out of the kingdom? Let's go one other place first. And I wish I had a perfect answer to this. I don't have the answer to that question. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. The Bema Seat Judgment. And we're going to start at verse 10. All right. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can, can anyone lay than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, which is our Messiah. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, uh, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, last thousand years, will declare it because it will be revealed from fire. Prophetically, fire is judgment. It will be revealed by fire, and fire will test each one's works. Of what sort it is. Okay. Now understand the Bema seat judgment is for believers. 
after the rapture, we get judged. How are we getting judged? By each one's work of what sort it is. Um, hopefully there's no problem. I'm getting notes. Again, new computer. I'm getting notes that like the audio was changed from one to another, and I hope it's not affecting this too bad. We'll find out when I'm done. All right, so we're being judged by our work. Again, for positions. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, judgment, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Okay, I just thought I'd read that again to understand that our work are going to be judged. If anyone's work, which he has built on, it endures, he will receive a reward. These are the crowns that we get. And we will later cast them off. That's how when a Messiah comes back, he has many crowns. It's a post-tribulation rapture. How does he get the crowns? Because we won't get the crowns until he's already come back. And then how do we cast them off for him to put them on? Just a silly little thought. Anyhow, um, if anyone's work, which he has built on it indoors, he will receive a reward. Okay, let's look back at those things. If it's judged by fire, will gold withstand fire, silver and precious stones? Yes, I know the gold and silver get purified that way. Would wood, hay, and straw be, uh, survive fire? No. Okay. So there's things that we do are for the kingdom, and there's things that we do for ourselves that are not for the kingdom. Let's go. Let's keep reading, verse sixteen. Do you uh, do you know that you are the temple of God, that the Spirit dwells within you? If anyone, I'm sorry, did I miss something here? Give me a second. Ah, verse fifteen. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So you're going to be smelling a little smoky. Okay, but you're still in the kingdom of heaven and you have no reward. You may not have a crown other than the crown of life. Okay. Um, when people be looking at you like you smell him, oh, he didn't do too well, did he? Oh, he failed. He at least he's here, you know, at least he's here. But what's the difference between being least in the kingdom of heaven, going into heaven smoky, and being said, Depart from me, I never knew you. What's the difference? And Messiah made it clear it's about lawlessness, the condition of being without Torah, either by choice or ignorance. I don't know. I can't give you an exact answer. What I have to guess is both with when the angels are gathering out of the kingdom all that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and Messiah is saying, if people are going to come to me and they're going to be showing me your fruit, and I will say, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. There's a word in there for both of those. Practice. People who practice it. People who make an art out of it. People who try to get better at not following the law. Okay. And a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, Jesus just came to show that you can't do it anyhow. So you just trust him and you're good. And you know, why bother? If you can't do it all, why bother? No one was able to do it perfectly except Messiah and I can't either. Um, if you want to be a lawyer, an electrician, a plumber, and you got to take a test, whatever it is that you want to do, and you know you cannot get 100% on that test, do you not bother taking it because you can't do it perfectly? Of course not. That would be silly. Same thing here. Now, we're going to look at something Paul wrote that is actually pretty cool. I think that's where we're going next. Um, no, that's not where we're going next. Give me a second. Make sure I've got my stuff in order. Yeah. Let's go to Mark 12. What's most important? What's most important when it comes to the law? And let's not get confused about this as to what this actually says. So we're going to look at Mark 12, 28 through 31.
And here we go. And give me a second here. Hey, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't leading you astray with what I'm about to say. Yeah, this is during the time that Messiah, right before crucifixion, the four days that Messiah would have been in the temple to be tested, to be made sure that he was that Passover lamb that was without fault, without blemish. Okay, so everybody there is trying to question him. And that's, you'll see that in um, Exodus 12. Um, at the very beginning of Exodus 12, where the Passover lamb is in the house, synagogue, temple, that's what the same word in Hebrew, for four days. So Messiah had to be there four days, Sunday through Wednesday, to be tested. And this is one of the parts of the test. And it says in, in Matthew 12, verse 28, it says, Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived. That he had an upside. Did I get missed something wrong here? Wait, 28 through 31. Um, perceived that he answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now they're just trying to catch him up. They're trying to get him to say something that's wrong. Jesus answered him. The first of all, the commandment is, Hero Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay. What, what is, is Messiah making this up? No, that's Deuteronomy 6. That's just Shema. And you shall love the God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So let's stop and forget all the other commandments. These are the only two that matter, right? Jesus has told us there's nothing greater than these. This is what you do. Let's keep reading. As I've heard that, I've heard people say that. Um, give me a second. I may have to go to another book. I'm going to pause here. Hey, sorry, I got a phone call. I had to take it. I'd been waiting on it. But anyhow, because we read we read this in Mark about this, about the the import the important commandments. It's funny when you read down to verse 12 or verse 34, Mark 12, it says, Now when Jesus saw that he'd answered, I'm sorry, now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, Um, anyhow, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him again. So this is like basically he's passed the test. Um, and then Jesus starts asking them questions. Um, and when it says the sages, these were like the lawyers. These were like the guys that were like the experts on the law. So, so they're like the lawyers. Now, in Matt Mark, we get the, the impression that those are the only two things that matters, right? Let's go to Matthew. And see what see what Messiah says in Matthew. We're going to look at the same basic story, and we're going to go to Matthew twenty two. And I'm just going to pick out one thing. And it's somewhere around twenty eight. You know, let's, it's Matthew, and we're going to see the same basically thing in Matthew 22. I'm just going to read from verse 36 down. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and all of the prophets. So all of the law, all the commandments and prophets are wrapped up in those two. It's not that those two replace everything, okay? They are 
th those two encompass everything stems from it they hang on it okay you can't get away from the law and the prophets but if you're missing those two things loving god with everything you got and loving yourself uh, excuse me loving others and yourself then all the rest don't really matter because you miss the same part let's go back to matthew 5 and we'll see what the the problem what the fair the, the problem that the pharisees and the sages had back then matthew 5 and we don't want to have this problem either and we're going to go down to verse yeah, come on, Dave. Sorry about that. Give me a second here. All right. So when we when we, we read Matthew 15 about whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called greatest in the or least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I bet, you know, the Pharisees and the sages, they're just like singing praises to him at this point. Because, yeah, they do that. They even find a little bit of the cumin and all this other stuff. They're like singing his praises until he says this. Verse 20, for I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So their righteousness what they're doing is not righteousness. Why? They have the wrong attitude. They're not loving others. Actually, we know they're bad shepherds and they were feeding off the flock. They weren't feeding the flock. They weren't loving God. They were doing it as a sort of a ritual. They're doing and just going through the motions. And that's not what we need to be doing. We need to be doing it for the right reasons. And what is it? John 14, 15. If you love me, You'll obey my commandments. Who wrote Torah? Messiah, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He wrote it. If you love him, you're going to obey him. But this is where it starts. Loving others, loving God with everything you got, loving others as yourself. What's interesting in there, you also have to love yourself. You can't love others as yourself if you don't love yourself. All right. Um... So how does this all boil down? What are we supposed to do now? What am I supposed to do? I tell you. Understand in Zechariah, there's actually a prophecy. Um, I'll pause and pull it up for you real quick. It's Zechariah 8.23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, 10 men from every language. How do you get 10 men from every language when there's far more languages than 10? It's a minion, just a representative number. Of every nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man saying, let us go with you. But we have heard that the God, that God is with you. Well, what you don't get is the sleeve of a Jewish man. That's the kunaf. That's the corner of the road. That's where the zitzi, which is the little tassel thing that has 613 twists and turns for each of the laws, and the one blue thread that represents Messiah that runs through it. See, they're grabbing the law. They're grabbing onto Torah. They're grabbing onto God's instruction. This is a end times prophecy. As it says, thus says the Lord of hosts. That's an end times prophecy. This is what I'm doing. This is what people are seeing. Well, how do we, as Gentiles who have never followed the law, how do we do that? Okay, let's start with um, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Psalm. What did I say? 139. Twenty-three and twenty-four. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Find me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wickedness, wicked way in me, and lead me in way in the way everlasting. 
lead me to everlasting life is what he's asking him. But by searching me. So ask the Lord to reveal to you what it is that you should be doing. Ask him. He will answer that prayer. Now, it's probably not going to be somebody like me doing a video telling you specifically what to do, outline A, B, C, D, E. And it's probably not going to be like somebody's going to send you an email or God's going to like send you a text. That's not going to happen. It'll be an urging, a nudge, this feeling within you that you know you need to do X, Y, and Z or not do X, Y, and Z, if you know what I mean. That's how he will lead you. Um the Sabbath. Oh my goodness. The Sabbath is the most important. Um, go to Romans 6, 17. I want to give you a principle here that Paul gave us. But God be thanked that through you, you were slaves to sin, and you opened from the, this is not it, 616, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself um, slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? What sin? Lawlessness. In other words, if God tells you worship on the Sabbath and the Pope tells you it's okay, worship on Sunday, not the Sabbath. And it is the Pope Constantine, the Catholic Church, that changed the day we worship, that changed the Sabbath. Okay. And it doesn't matter the reasoning. When God said to do something forever and somebody else tells you not to do it and you listen to them, you become their servant. You become their slave, slave and servant, same word. Don't get hung up on that. Okay. You're it's the same. But anyhow, you become theirs, not God's. So when you are following and listening to instruction, Taurus instruction, that's different than what we find in scripture, then you become that person's slave. And I actually have, I couldn't find it offhand, but quotes where the Catholic Church basically says this, by all these other denominations, by following our lead and worshiping on this on the Sabbath, or excuse me, on Sunday, and calling that their Sabbath, they are um, admitting their loyalty, their allegiance to the Catholic Church. I'm going to attach a video that talks about this a little bit. I couldn't find those quotes, and those quotes came from cardinals and bishops and, and different um, Catholic sources that actually said that. Um, something else I want to tell you that Paul tells us. Give me a minute. Let me find it. Go to Romans 2. See, understand that loving God and loving others is the most important. And that's what everything comes down from. So Romans 2 um four through 16 and we're going to see what i just told you about who you obey or you do despise the riches of his goodness forbearance long suffering not knowing that the goodness of god leads to repentance but in accordance with the hardness of your impenitent heart unrepentant heart you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. What is the righteous judgment? If God says, if you don't follow the Sabbath, you, if you do this, you are going to die. Then when you do it and you die eternally, that's just because you were told ahead of time. Um, or will you render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. What is seeking good? Well, God gave you the, the instructions of what's good and what's bad. That's forward. Those are the instructions. That's what he's talking about. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey righteousness, indignation, and wrath. Okay, we're going to talk at truth in a little bit. Um, 
This is important to hear this and get this through. But glory, I'm missing something here. Tribulation, anguish, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, and the Jew first, and also the Greek. But in glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works, that is good, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God, so it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Gentile, this is for you. For as many have sinned without law will also perish without law. So if you're sinning, then without law, if you weren't given the law, okay, specifically, you still are going to perish with by not following it because it is inherent. We would see it. It's inherent within us. And that's what this is going to tell us. As so many have sinned in the law, they will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are judged in sight of God, but the doers of the law will be judged. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. To show the work of the law written on their hearts, their consciousness also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Okay, what he's basically telling you is that inherently we know the law. It is inscribed within us to doing right. And the whole thing about loving God with everything you've got and obeying him and loving others, even if you're not like trying to find, well, this is Deuteronomy or this is in Leviticus that I should like take care of my neighbor. Um, if we're just doing it because that's what God's put in our heart, you get credit for that. See, that's the difference between, to me, that's the difference between practicing and not practicing. But I'm telling, but you know, if Jesus in time said, if you didn't know, you're not guilty. Now that you know, you're guilty. Bottom line, bottom line, if he's nudging you, urging you that you need to be following something, you need to do it. This is prayer. This is repentance, praying, asking God to show you what's unlike you in heart. Okay. What does it mean to keep the Sabbath? Oh, good question. And I'll be honest, there's no way I can do everything. And you have to look at like what the context was then. And generally those Sabbath days, what it says is not to do any customary work. Okay. And there are specific commandments that are everlasting commandments, not the cook on the Sabbath. I cook on the Sabbath. That is not my customary word. All right. In Jesus's day, when if you cooked on this, if you were cooking, oh my goodness, you were butchering the animal, you're cure, you're you're doing all of this work, you're making the fire. It's not just like you know, putting a couple of pop tarts in the toaster or whatever you may do. And no, I, I actually don't eat pop tarts. I just threw that out. But there's a big difference. So for me, I have my own business. I will not grab the checks out of the mailbox and go down and post them in my computer. I will not answer or return phone calls from customers. If I receive a phone call from somebody and I answer and it's a customer, I will talk to them. I'll ask them. The, and it's usually if I'm driving, I don't know who's calling. And yes, I drive on the Sabbath. I go more than a Sabbath day journey. I'm not out walking, right? Again, and it's not that you have to do every little thing. The bottom line is, what is in your heart? What is your desire? Is your desire to love the Lord and to obey him? And a lot of the people that that I've had many people try to like attack me, like, what about this law? Do you do that? What about this law? Do you do that? You don't keep the law. Nobody can. It's not what it is. It's in the heart. It's a heart thing. I mean, it's really hard to do this. And I know somebody's going to get upset and whatever. Um, but there's other people, I've had more than one person ask me, what does it mean? And it, it may look different to me than it does to you. Um, and I know there's going to be some people who are, um, you know, messianic who were just like, you know, I don't want to, that are very observant of everything. 
and they might not think I'm going far enough. That's okay. The question is, what is God leading you? Pray. He will tell you. See, the Sabbath was the most important thing. Why was the children of Israel, why was uh, Babylon, uh, why were they taken to Babylon? Why was Judea taken to Babylon? For missing, seriously, for missing 70 Shemitah years. That's a Sabbath rest of the land. Jeremiah said, if you just keep the Sabbath, you'll be good. And they didn't do it. That's important. I want to look at, um, give me a second. Oh, where is this? Leviticus 11. Let's talk a little bit about what we eat. I knew for a long time what God said about food. And it took me forever to do it. Um, I'm going to read through this. Go ahead, read along with me. Understand when you look at these fish or these animals, most of these animals, most of them are the filters, the ones that eat the garbage, the ones that eat the stuff just to keep the environment clean. They're eating garbage. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying to them, speak to the children of Israel saying, these are the animals which you may eat among the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides its hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing on cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these shall not, you shall not eat among those who chew the cud or that have cloven hoofs. The camel, because it chews its cud, it does not have cloven hoofs. It is unclean to you. The rock spyrex, I don't know what that is, because it chews the cud, it does not have a cloven hoof. Um, let me go down a little bit. The hair, because it chews the cud but doesn't have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. Um, and the swine, though it divides the hooves, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the uh, cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcass you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Ooh, little extra there for the piggies. Um, yeah, Rome started the uh, Easter ham. Yeah, not good. These you may eat, or the Christmas ham. These you may eat that are in, in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales. Whether it is in the seas or in the rivers, you may eat. But all in the seas, in the rivers that do not have fins or scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. Abomination is not a word to be taken lightly. They are an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcass his, as an abomination. Whatever is in the water that does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. Shrimp, lobster, catfish. Mussels, clams. I thought these would be hard to give up. They weren't. I did, I don't know, two years ago? Something like that. I gave it all up, even though I knew for a long time before that that I should. If you keep reading down here, and I'm not going to keep reading all this, you're going to find abomination, abomination. This is an abomination. That is an abomination. Some of these ones I have no, no problem with. You're not supposed to eat mouths. I have no problem with that. But let's see, where it is it? I'm going to find one. Why? Why is this important? Why does God tell us? First of all, he says you will be defiled for doing it. And that, um, and let's look at Leviticus 11, verse 43. You shall make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creeps, nor shall you make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. 
neither shall you defile yourself with any creeping things on earth. So in other words, he's saying you should be holy because I am holy. And if you eat these things, you are not holy. Okay. And he's saying, for I am the Lord, your God. In other words, there is no argument against it. He is the Lord, your God. And he's telling you, why do you call him Lord, Lord, and not do what he says? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Okay, let me keep reading. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. There is a law of animals and of the birds and every living creature that moves on the water and every creature that creeps on the earth to distinguish between the unclean and the clean and between the animals that may be eaten and animals that you may not be eaten. Now, I know. Peter changed it. I changed it when he put down that sheet. That was a fleet, not a sheet. And what, what animals to eat, get up and eat? What did Peter say? No, 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 I've never done that. I'll tell you what that is real quick. Give me a second. I need to find the scripture. I'm going to pause. I'm going to find the scripture. So why was Peter, oh, wait a minute. No, Lord, I've never done this. He later, if you read down, he says he realizes he was talking about people, not food, not anything unclean that God said was clean. Okay, um, God doesn't change his word. See, Peter understood Deuteronomy 13. Let's turn there. Um, starting in verse 1. There arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams that give you a sign or a wonder. Think about the uh, false prophet um, who's going to be in the presence of the Antichrist will be sending down fire from heaven, something that happened in the days of Elijah. Hmm. Okay, think about that for a minute. Is that from God? No. Okay, if a false prophet if among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, he gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known. Let us serve them. That's that principle. If you follow what somebody else said, God tells you one thing, but somebody else tells you something else, and you follow what the other person, you are that person's servant. You are that person's slave not God's, because you're not doing what God told you to do, all right? So you shall not listen. Um, anyhow, let me read that. In the sign or wonder comes the past, verse 2, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve him. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, because the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So in other words, if God tells you to do one thing and you do something else, you are failing the test of whether or not you love God with everything you've got. Plain and simple. Peter understood that. That's why Peter was so emphatic. No, Lord, I've never done that. Four. Deuteronomy 3, 4, 13, 4. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments, and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that's only for the Jews. Well, if you're not part of the children of Israel, you are not in the millennial kingdom with Messiah. Okay, you're a stranger. All right. Um, again, the way this looks for me is probably the way it looks different for you. Um, you know, I don't know exactly where that boundary line is, but I, I really believe that if you continue to thumb your nose at what God says and you don't and you don't care about following the law, what God says, and you just believe that, you know, Messiah just changed everything and you don't have to do anything. Um actually let me give me another verse I want to look for. Give me a second here. Um Lip and word. Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not break, nor 
alter the word that has gone out of my lips. He's not going to change what he told you with regard to the law. There is no difference, Jew or Gentile. Um, one more verse, and I'm going to wrap this up. Um, Uh, I know we're going to be going to John. Ah. Give me a second. I'm going to pause. I'll be right back. And go to John 10. Um, and we've talked about this in some of our other videos. Remember the uh, shepherds were bad shepherds. They were feeding off others' flocks, uh, off the flock rather than feeding the flock. Go to John and we're just going to start at John fourteen, uh, John ten fourteen. I am the good shepherd, and I and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, which are not in this fold, them also I must bring. And they hear my voice, and they will be, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. There is no divide between Jew and Gentile. That's not how we divide things up. It's not Jew and Gentile. There is one shepherd and one flock. And when Messiah in John 10, he's talking to Jews. It's the non-Jews that are the other shepherds that need to go into that Jewish flock. Okay, see, we need to rightfully divide the word. And there is some places I decide I'm going to take this a little longer. And a lot of this video, I did some notes, but I just prayed that God would correct me. Um, let me see, word. All right, I'm, I need to wait. Here we go. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. Okay, this is Awana. Approved workmen are not ashamed. Awana, this is, you know, I've taught Awana. This was like the tagline verse for the program. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightfully dividing the word of truth. So we want to look at two things. We're going to look at what does it mean to rightfully divide the word and what is truth, all right? And we're going to wrap this all up. Okay, rightfully dividing the word. And this is cool that I can do this. I'm in the letter Bible and I can pull up the definitions right here on the computer screen. Yes, I'm, I'm not a tech guy, but I'm glad I got this new computer for doing this. All right, that word, rightfully dividing. Here's the definition. To cut straight, to cut straight ways. To proceed on straight paths. Hold a straight course. To Equivalent to doing right. To make straight and smooth. To handle a right. Teach the truth directly and correctly. Do you get anything in here to say dividing Jew from Gentile? No. And you th I think Messiah's got the sword of the word that's, that divides right from wrong. See, we want to divide the truth correctly. And that's what this scripture is actually telling us to do. So we want to look at a number of scriptures about truth, okay? And 
the first one, and I'm going to try to Google these as we do it or search for them as we do it, because I don't have them memorized. The first one is easy. It's John 14, verse 6. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So it, it doesn't anywhere in Scripture does it say that Paul is the truth? No, it does not. Messiah is the truth. Paul doesn't go around changing what Messiah does. I can't tell you the number of times I've quoted Messiah, and people say, yeah, but Paul said this. Yeah. Peter told us Paul's and it leads untrained, untaught individuals into, um, what is, how is it worded? Um, to ways that are not good. It's not exactly what it says. To their own demise or their own destruction. All right, now, let's go. And I'm going to look up another one real quick. Um, first John five six, and again, if I'm going too fast, I apologize. You can always pause, turn to the scriptures. This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. This is crucifixion. Blood was shed, and water came out of Him. I never understood the water coming out of them. I know I've heard you know doctors say that it can happen and whatever. But see, at the same time that Messiah was crucified, there were thousands, tens of thousands of lambs being crucified. I don't know the number. But they're being sacrificed in the temple. We're outside of the temple, and they have a cistern of water that comes through to wash away the blood. So if somebody's watching Messiah our Lord and Savior being crucified, they can turn and see the temple and see the blood and water coming out of the temple as well. Messiah is that temple. All right. John, uh, 1 John 5 and 6, or 5, 6. He is the one that, I'm sorry, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. So we have Messiah is truth. We have um, the Spirit is truth. Remember in, we started back Messiah saying that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. No. So we're going to see that the word is truth. And that we're going to find in the book of Psalms. Um, Psalm 119, 160. For the entirety of your word is truth. As every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. So what are the righteous judgments? The judgments are things in instruction in Torah that say, if you do this, then this is what this is the punishment. That's the judgment for it. It's righteous because God gave it to you, and you know what it is up front, or you should, and ignorance is no excuse. Okay. So if it says you were to die and somebody were to carry out that judgment, that judgment is on you, not the person who carries it out. A lot of the stuff, you know, this, you'll die for this, you'll die for that. It's, um, how do I word it? I believe a lot of it is more eternally, eternal death. If you're not, if you're seriously, if you're practicing not following God's ways, you're probably not loving people the way God says you're supposed to. And you're not, you're not loving God the way you're supposed to. So you're on that stairway, the highway to hell, not the stairway to heaven. Um, so what else is truth? We've got every word of scripture. And by the way, when David wrote, there was only the Old Testament. But anyhow, every word of scripture, we have Messiah is the truth. We have the spirit is the truth. So can 
Messiah tell you something that's different than the word of God? No, he cannot. In fact, he tells us he only gives us, speaks the word that God gives him because he's that prophet like Moses that will be raised up. But um, can the Holy Spirit tell you to do something different than the word? No, because they're all truth. There's one more component of, of truth I want to bring out. And Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Your law is truth. That word law is Torah. Your instruction is truth. So if Messiah is truth and the Spirit is truth and every word of Scripture is truth and the law is truth, they cannot contradict each other. Righteousness. We, we Righteousness. Right standing with God, right? I want to look at... If I spell those right. Paul. In Romans 6. Turn to Romans 6. Um, okay. Romans 6, starting in verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves to righteousness. Okay. Now this again, you are slaves, servants to the one you are serving. If you are Sin, you're serving sin, that is your master. If you're not serving sin, you're serving God, that is your master. And you do it by with who you obey. If you obey the sin, if you obey what man or something else tells you that's contrary to the word of God, then that's who you are serving. That's your master. If you are serving the word of God, serving God, then you are obedient to the word of God. That is your master, one or the other, okay? And he's going to give you some opposites here. And having set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Yeah, I'm fine with being a slave of righteousness, right? I speak in human terms because weakness of your flesh. For just as you present your members as slaves of uncleanness, that's all the piggies, the... Um, Oh, there's so much involved in unclean, dead bodies, different things that the word tells you is unclean. And lawlessness needing to lure lawlessness. You know what? My apologies. I mean, this is good stuff about lawlessness, and I would continue to dig into it, but it's not where I wanted to go. Where I wanted to go is second. Corinthians 6. And then we got one more place to get to. No, we're good. We're going to end with this. Do not be yoked. 2 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship? And the unequally yoked let me a couple of things. If you had like a big bull and a little cow, and they're not going to go straight, you're not going to go down the straight and narrow path. You're going to be swerving all over the place because they're not going to pull equally. Um, because those two are yoked together. The yoke was actually an idiom also referring to the law. When Jesus, when Messiah said, take my yoke because it's easy, he's talking about the law. This is not the law that the Jews were observing. You know, there's 513, do this, don't do that, whatever in scripture. But then you have the fences. These are all the things that the Jews added to the law. It's like, oh yeah, well, it makes sense to put, if there's a, if there's a pit and you're going to fall into the pit and hurt yourself, you want to put a fence around it. And this is what I've heard. But there are thousands and thousands of laws to keep you to stop from breaking the laws in Torah. Literally, thousands. 
For example, it tells you do not eat a calf boiled in its mother's milk, and I believe it's a calf. So the response from the Judaism, from the um, from Judaism, is you do not eat meat and dairy together. That's why if I go to an Orthodox Jewish deli and I ask for a roast beef and cheese, they will not serve it to me. They will not make it. They can give me a roast beef sandwich and then serve me cheese and sell me cheese on the side. I've done that before. Okay. These are called the Levitical laws. Is that rabbinical laws? Okay. From the rabbis that they made up to keep you away from it. Messiah and, and the rabbis inflicted all the time about these okay think about when they're out in the fields eating the heads and they eat the heads and they're like oh they're working on the sabbath what does messiah do he goes into their synagogue and heals a man with a withered hand on the sabbath to confront them over how they are viewing these things anyhow i'm sorry i got carried off on a tangent there do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? If you're yoked with an unbeliever, they're more likely to take you down than bring you up. Um, there is a passage that tells us that People are like elevators. They take you up or down. Actually, it says, do not be confused. Bad character or bad company corrupts good character. Okay. But these are all opposites. Do you have any depth, any confusion that light and darkness are opposites? So righteousness and lawlessness are opposites. And we read the definition for lawlessness earlier. It's the condition of being without Torah either by choice or ignorance. Anyhow, I know I've dwelled and droned on and on. My thought was some people will make it to the end if they're real interested. The other people will catch the part they wanted and just watch part of it or, you know, early. And they'll cut out when they want to. This is the cry of my heart. It is. It is what you will see this underlying all of my videos. My concern is a lot of people who think they're going are not, and they're on a highway to hell because they are practicing lawlessness. Anyhow, and it's hard because as soon as I tell somebody and I confront somebody and I tell them that, they get all defensive and not oh, works, 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 works. You know what? We'll see what happens eternally. I'd rather you know be safe than sorry. God bless you guys. Maranatha, take care.